Welcome to Marriage Day Podcast. I'm Jimmy Evans. This is my wife, Karen. And this podcast exists to help every couple thrive in marriage. And you can thrive in marriage. We're talking on this uh, podcast today about indestructible love. How do you have a love? Because a lot of people say they're in love with each other. Uh, and then not too long after that, they're not in love with each other, you know. Uh, but how can you have a love that endures? And that's what this program is about. And I'm, we're going to go to a teaching here in just a minute where I'm teaching on this subject. But Karen, we're going to start with some questions okay. uh, from some of our listeners. And let me read this to you. It says, my husband and I have been married a bit over a year now, and I want to bring up the scary topic of kids. We have a very good open communication type of relationship, but this one is so hard for me to bring up. I think I'm worried he's not ready because life isn't perfect. Any suggestions on how to breach this topic in a casual way without it being such a major moment? Oh, well, it's so funny because she says they have open communication, but she can't talk about it. Yeah. It's, it might be a problem. But no, seriously, I, I can understand, though, anything that's difficult. You know, we yeah. feel that you know, this is one of the reasons I think pre-married counseling is so important. Yeah. You know, for people out there that are still thinking about getting married, you need to figure out these things before you even, you know, come to the altar and have those discussions of how many children, you know, where are we going to live? What's our religion? All the different stuff. And so, but with this, it's just children. I mean, the the, the Lord says they're a blessing. And so, you know, look at it from the perspective of, you know, I'm going to trust God that, you know, he wants me to have children. If he wants me to have children, then when it's time for us to have children, my husband and I can come in agreement with that. And so just bring it up casually. Just say, you know, hey, have you been thinking about have kids? You know how we did it. We'd been married. Set no, not did it. We <laughs> <laughs> this is not that type of podcast. <laughs> okay. So you know how we we were married seven months. We were laying in bed. I'll never forget in our cockroach infested apartment. And I was laying around. I was like, wouldn't that be so cool to have kids? And you're like, sure. Pregnant just like that. That was how we planned. So, but I think it's really, really smart to sit down and talk about it and just. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I, I did pre-marriage counseling with a couple and, um, and I asked him how many kids you want. He wanted six. She wanted two. Mm -hmm. And he was, and he said, no, we're having six. And she said, not by me. You're not. Well, that they had that fight in the office. I, I really can't remember what happened to him. I don't think they got married, but th the time to have that conversation is before you get married. Absolutely. But yeah, you know, she needs to bring it up and. It's of it's of concern because kids are so important. Having a family is so important, mm -hmm. and it kind of sounds like he doesn't want that. Well, she's not sure. She hasn't even talked to him about it. Well, there you go. <laughs> yeah, the, she and this is her husband. You know, so they're married. Well, you that's what to... I'm saying. I think there's a little more to this, but yeah. Anyway, good answers. Okay, you have a question for me. Uh, when your spouse has tendencies to get in moods that aren't so pleasant to be around, how can you disarm it when they have trouble connecting the dots between how they're really feeling and how they're truly acting? Oh, gosh, that's going to be tough for you. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Well, 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 just explain. Let me explain. He's not a feeler. So uh, it's real hard for him to get in touch with emotions. <laughs> well, here's what I would say, because I live with a feeler. And that and I'm not saying you're moody, I'm just saying hey. no, but but what I'm saying is you just live through it. You know, let let people have their moods. Now, you know, I mean if it's a, a you know, violent mood or horrible mood or something, it's one thing. But you know, the when I when we first got married, Karen, and you would have your times and <laughs> and you know, I would react to it because I didn't like it and I took it personally. I always took it personally, it's always about me. What I realize is it's not about, it's, it's typically not about me. It's about life. It's just about, you know, you, you have such a profound uh, emotional connection with <laughs> everything just, around you. You're just digging yourself no, I'm serious. Out. <laughs> I'm serious. You know, you have an emotional connection to the trees in the yard. I you really, I, I know you do. I know you do. I don't. Thank you. I don't want one. Uh, but, but my point being, I realized that, and I realized that when you're going through something, it's probably not about me. It's about that. So to be available, if you want to talk, to be available, if you want to, you know, if, if, if I need to help, we were talking this morning, getting ready. And you were talking about something that was bothering you. And I said, is there anything I can do? And you said, no. Okay. But the point being, if I can do anything, I want to do something, but otherwise I'm just going to be there to help you live through it, yeah. you know? And I just think, and it's like you said from that last question, uh, and you said, you know, you can't 
don't try to fix it, you know. And sometimes a woman doesn't need you to fix it. That's she just right. needs you to care, right. you know, and just come in, like you all were saying in the sermons, that come into her world and just, yeah. even if you don't understand it, you know, just just say, hey, like you said this morning, I'm here for you. Whatever I can do to help. Exactly. Yeah. Well, so I'm, I'm a little bit of an expert on that. And, but I'm not an expert on feelings. Nope. That's I'm just for an sure. expert on living with somebody who's got them. Okay. So we're going to go into this teaching now on indestructible love. Hope you enjoy this. Karen and I uh, fell in love when we were 16 years old. And, you know, we told each other we loved each other, but our love ran out. And after several years of marriage, we were out of love. And we told each other that, that we were out of love. And we have to admit that many people who fall in love today and genuinely believe that they love each other and they get married, their love will not endure. Their love. Now, now there's no way, listen to me, there is no way that agape love will ever say, I don't love you anymore. It can't say, God can never say, God so loved you that he gave Jesus. It is impossible for God to ever say to you, I don't love you anymore. That's why agape love is so superior. It doesn't need chemistry. It doesn't need an affinity. It doesn't need an emotion. It, it is an, an unconditional love of the will. I choose to love you. And so many people who fall in love, they fall in love based on chemistry or sexual attraction or emotion or something like that. And it just runs out. It's, it, it's not, it will not endure till death to us part. It simply will not. And either you divorce or just live miserable for the rest of your lives. So here's the difference between God's love and other types of love. First of all, I wanna ask you some questions and don't answer these out loud, but just wanna ask you some questions if you're married. And that is, uh, do you love your spouse? Okay, don't, don't answer out loud. And just, I don't wanna start any fights in here. I, I don't have time to stick around and counsel. So, uh, do you love your spouse? Okay, okay, so. If yes, what do you mean by that? What, what, when you say to your spouse, I love you, what does that mean to you? Okay. If no, if I said, do you love your spouse? You say, no, I, I think I'm out of love with my spouse. What do you mean by that? If yes, what is the difference? If you say, yes, I love my spouse, what is the difference between, between the way you love them and the way you love food, your pets, or something else? And see, we throw, the, the English language is a very inefficient language. We have, I can't remember, I think it's something like, we have 10,000 words in our language. It's like the Greek language has 35,000 words. The, the Greek language is much more efficient because we say, I love hot dogs, I love the cowboys, and I love my wife. There's something wrong with that. Now, the cowboys and Karen, never mind. Okay, so I, don't tell her I said that. Okay. But we need a better, we need a better, language. We need a better understanding of the word. We love everything. We just love, the word love just means absolutely nothing in our culture. You have to admit it. And so here are the five kinds of love in the Greek language. And so if you're speaking Greek and you want to say that you love something, you can be very exacting about what you mean by it. There's a word in the Greek language is epithemia. Okay. This is where we get our word thermos. It means passion. And so if I'm saying I love the cowboys or I love to hunt or I love to golf or I love this or that, I'm talking about I'm very passionate about that. That's epithet the man, that's great, okay? But that's the word specifically. Eros, we all know what that means. It's erotic. That's where we get our word erotic, is sexual love. And so we have to admit that a lot of the people that are telling another person today that they love them, they're talking about a sexual attraction, okay? Phileo. Phileo is brotherly love, it's friendship. Philadelphia is philos and Delphia. Delphia is brother, philos is brotherly love or friendship. And so if, I, if you have a friend that you're very fond of, a, a brother or sister in Christ or someone and you tell them you love them, that's what you're saying. You're saying I phileo you. Storge uh, is a family bond. It's a bond that you just simply have with your family members because they're family. It's like you have weird relatives but you love them anyway, you know. Because there, there's a love there that goes beyond chemistry or affinity or things like that. It's, I feel a love for you because you're family. That's storge love. And then the fifth type of love is agape love. Listen, it is the only brand of love that doesn't need an emotion. It doesn't need an emotion. Every other type of love is an emotion-based love. And that's why they're inferior. They cannot function without an emotion present. Agape love is the only non-emotional based love. So here, let me ask again, I've got more questions for you. 
The first question, do you love your spouse? Okay, based on what I just said. And you might say, well, I phileo my spouse, or I storge my spouse, but you know, I don't know if I you know, agape them. If so, if you, if you are measuring, if, if you do love your spouse, are you measuring that primarily by an emotion or decision of your will? Is your love an emotion-dependent love? That's what I'm asking. So if you say, yes, I love my spouse, but I think it's because I feel good about them right now. Sometimes I wonder. If not, if you say, no, I don't love my spouse, what do you mean by that? Lost, you lost your passion? You were once more passionate and now you're not as passionate. Lack of sexual interest. It used to be that y'all had a, a better sex life and now you don't have it. You're no longer friends. You don't feel goodwill in the relationship. And here's another question. With what type of love do you want to be loved by God and your spouse? Now this is an important question. Think about this for just a minute. Okay. Do you want unconditional or conditional love? From, let's just talk about God for just a minute. Do you want God to love you because you're having a good day and he's pleased? Or do you want God to love you in spite of the fact that you're having a bad day? Everybody, everybody, Sim is that kind of a simple one? Okay. Of course, you, I want unconditional love. I, I don't want a point system. I don't want to have to be performing constantly for God to love me. However, in marriage, many times, that's exactly what happens is our love is an emotion-based love based on how our spouse is performing for us at that moment or during that period of time. Okay, so I want to be loved with a, a trans-circumstantial, unconditional love. That's the way I want to be loved, okay? And so here's another question. What type of love do you believe is the best foundation for your marriage? Okay, all the types of love that I mentioned, by the way, should be in our marriages. Uh, we should have fond feelings and passion for one another, sexuality, all of those things like that, family bond, all, all of those things should be present. But understand this, we all have a foundation for our love. In your friendships, in your relationship with God, in your relationship with spouse, all of us have a foundational concept of, of love. And that concept is either an emotion or a decision. It, it, you can't have both. The foundation, I'm not talking about all of them. And so, let me, let me say something else. You can't give away what you don't have. And if you believe that God's love for you is conditional and based on an emotion, you can only give that away. See, for years in my life, even as a Christian, I, had, I, I grew up under performance. I, I grew up in a performance-based system in every area of my life. And the system was, if you do good, it'll be all right. We like you better. If you don't do good, it won't be okay. We don't like you as well. And you're always performing to try to be liked better and to be accepted or, or whatever like that. That's performance-based love. Understand, if that's your brand of love, that's what you give to everybody else. Everybody around you, it's just it's tit for tat. If, if you're good to me, if you scratch my back, I'll scratch your back. You hack my back, I'll hack your back. It's just tit for tat. I'm just gonna give away what I have. And if you're not doing well, I can't give you better than you deserve. That, that's, that's what's wrong. But listen, if I believe, if I believe, that God loves me on my worst day. If I believe that God's love is a constant and I have good days and bad days and God's love is like this. It never goes down because I'm doing worse. It never goes up because I'm doing better. It can't go any higher. He loves me with an everlasting love. Somebody say amen. So that, what I'm saying is you have a foundation for how you love people. You have a foundation, an understanding of how you love your spouse. And what I'm saying, do you love your spouse? And inside, you're, you're being very honest now. Because Karen and I were out of love. I'm just saying, we, we were out of smack out of love. We were out of like. We were just out. And so I've been there and I understand. Our brand of love, when we told each other that we loved each other and that we wanted to get married, we had an inferior brand of love that could not endure marriage. And we found ourselves smack out of love because the foundation of our love was an emotion. Okay, here's the difference between agape love that it makes as the foundation of our marriage. Number one, agape love is consistent and keeps the trust and goodwill of the relationship strong. It's consistent. See, I don't know what my emotions are gonna do tomorrow. I, I just don't know. If I wake up tomorrow in a, in a funk, should I be mean to Karen? 
shouldn't, I shouldn't. And all the women said, no. <laughs> all women said that. No. If you're ruled by your emotions, you're an inconsistent lover. Because you can only love to the degree that you feel. You're a prisoner of your emotions. But if you have agape love, it means regardless of how I feel, regardless of what the circumstances are, and regardless of what you're doing, I'm gonna love you anyway. That's what, that's what God is. Isn't that the way God is? He doesn't love us based on performance. He doesn't love us based on a mood that he's in. He loves us the same all the time. Listen, when you have agape love is the foundation of your marriage, you're more consistent and that builds trust and it means you're better friends with each other, you have more passion, you have better sex and there's more of a family bond. Every other type of love flourishes on the foundation of agape love. When you don't have agape love, no other love can function as the foundation. It can't because it's inconsistent by its very nature. You're moody, you're controlled by your feelings. Another benefit of agape love is agape love closes the door on the devil as he tries to accuse your spouse, tell you that you made a mistake and tempts you to turn your heart and entertain sin. And the, the uh, devil in Revelation 12, 10 is called the accuser of the brethren. He loves to accuse us before God and each other. Ephesians 4, 27 calls him the slander. If we go to bed angry, it says we give a foothold to the slanderer and he can't wait. He, this is what he did with Karen and me. We fought and fought and fought. I went to bed on anger many times and the devil came to me and told me that I had made a mistake and offended me toward Karen. And I, I thought it was me, but it, was, it wasn't me, it was him. He comes stealthily. He says things like, they don't care about me, they only care about themselves. You're offended at your spouse. You know, they did something to make you mad or didn't do something you wanted them to do. I'm gonna live my life without true love if I stay married to them. These are the kind of thoughts the devil puts in your head. I made a mistake in marrying them. I'm not gonna to give to them until they change and say they are wrong. They are the problem and until they change, our marriage will be bad. Blank is the right person for me and when Karen and I were in the dark days of our marriage, I knew I had made a mistake and I thought, I, I knew the girl that I should have married, I thought, which was, was wrong. I wouldn't be in this situation if I were married to, to so-and-so. They are so weird, something is wrong with them. These are the kind of thoughts that the devil implants in your head. So um, 1 Corinthians 13 says, love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. You know the word for love there? Agape. Agape love will not receive an accusation. Agape love will not receive an offense. Agape love believes all things and hopes all things and bears all things. And so when the devil comes to you and he begins to accuse your spouse, he hates your marriage. He hates your marriage because it's the best thing for your life, it's the best thing for your children. God made it, there are a million reasons he hates your marriage, but he works overtime to try to split you up and he does it through accusations and slander. And agape love is the only love that has a shield strong enough to deflect that. I will not listen to you talk bad about my spouse devil. And yeah, we're going through a bad time right now, but that's okay. I know we're gonna come out of it and I know that they're the right person for me. I believe all things and I hope all things and that gives me the ability to endure all things. That's why agape love is so much better. Here's another reason that agape love is right for the foundation of our marriage. Agape love gives us the ability to give to our spouse when our needs are not being met and positive emotions are not 
present. It says that for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Let me ask you a question. Was the world doing right by God when God gave his son? No. The world that God gave his son to crucify the son. When we were in our sins, Jesus died for us. So in other words, agape love gave to us when we didn't deserve it. Is that right? Without agape love present in a relationship, there's always a point system present, like I was talking about earlier. It's tit for tat. But there are going to be times in your relationship when your spouse doesn't give to you. It, they're, they're just gonna be times. That's, that's why when we get married, we say for better, for worse, for rich, for poor, sickness and health. There are gonna be times of sickness, sometimes maybe serious or prolonged, times of grief or loss, loss of a loved one, loss of a job, disappointment, whatever, whatever it might be times of stress, financial pressure, difficulty, times of disagreement, frustration, times of sin and failure. And what happens is if you're not, if agape love is not the foundation of your relationship, you wait until your spouse is doing well because it's, it's, it's a brownie point system and it's a merit system. And so you, you haven't been doing well lately, so I'm not going to, I'm not going to do anything for you because you're not doing anything for me. Agape love gives when they're not getting Agape love is the only type of love that can give when it's not receiving back. That's why it says that God's love the world. Now, I know the answer to this, but aren't you glad when you were in your sins that Jesus died for you? He didn't wait for you to do well. When you were doing bad, he did for you. And aren't you glad that when you're having a bad day, he still loves you and answers your prayers? That's agape love. That's a God, it's completely unique to God and to God's people. It's completely unique. The world does not have that type of love. The world absolutely does not have any form of that type of love, and that's why they're doing so poorly in marriages. And even Christians, when we reject God's type of love for a superficial, shallow type of love that's totally emotion-based, it just can't serve as the foundation of our marriage. Let me say three more things about agape love. This is the dynamic power of agape love and what makes it so much better. Number one, agape love chooses its passion. The um, second thing I wanna say about agape love here is agape love is redemptive, not reactive or rejected. It says, so God loved the world that he gave his only son. So this is, this is 1 Peter 2, and this is calling us to be redeemers, to love people who aren't doing right. This is what a redeemer means. I'm gonna love you before you do right to redeem you into a right relationship. This is 1 Peter 2. For to this you were called, because Christ suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps, who committed no sin, nor was deceit found in his mouth, who, when he reviled, did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but committed himself to him who judges righteously, who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, having died to sin, might live for righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed, for you are like sheep going astray, but you have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your soul. So it's saying Jesus did the right thing while he was being crucified and he was suffering. He suffered for us to redeem us back to himself. And then, this is chapter two, chapter three is a continuation of the text. This, he's giving specific examples of redemption. Verse one, chapter three. Likewise, be submissive to your own husbands that even if some do not obey the word, they without a word may be won by the conduct of their wives when they observe your chaste conduct accompanied by fear. Do not let your ornament be merely outward, arranging the hair, wearing gold, 
or putting on fine apparel. Rather, let it be in the hidden person of the heart with the incorruptible beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is very precious in the sight of God. For in this manner, in former times, the holy women who trusted in God also adorned themselves, being submissive to their own husbands, as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters you are if you do good and are not afraid with any terror. Husbands, likewise, dwell with them with understanding, giving honor to the wife as to the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers not be hindered. Well, let me start with husbands here for just a minute. What it's saying here, he says, be redeemers, wives, husbands, both of you, redeem each other. And when I was in my sins, he died for me on the cross. And he left an example for me to follow in his footsteps. And the first example that Peter gives is husbands and wives. And he says to wives here, he says, if your husband is not obeying the word, they without a word will be won as they, uh, by the conduct of their wives when they observe your chaste conduct accompanied by respect. Okay, so let me say this. So how do you change your husband when he's doing poorly? Well, women are motivated by security. Men are motivated by respect. Respect is so powerful, we will change our behavior for the person giving it to us. Without a word, here's the promise from, from uh, Peter. If your husband is not doing what he ought to be doing, you can change him as he sees your pure respect. You're not sinning, not being unrighteous, and you're respecting it. Respect is the number one need of a man, and it's what motivates us. We'll never be changed through criticism. We'll never be changed by being put down or anything like that or being treated poorly. The thing that changes us is when you treat us the way, the way we don't deserve. And so only agape love can act above its feelings. Because it's not based on a feeling, it can act above its feelings. And when Jesus said, it was, when it says that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, only agape can do that. Emotion can't do that. Our emotions are naturally reactive. And when someone treats us bad, we want to respond in kind. And that's what destroys marriages. But what creates the greatest indestructible marriage is I'm not going to respond to you in kind. And if you're not meeting my needs, I'm going to meet yours. And if you're going through a hard time, I'm going to love you the same anyway. Doesn't mean I won't confront you. Doesn't mean we're not going to talk about it. But I'm not going to withdraw. I'm not going to punish you. And that's the spirit of a great marriage. One other thing, agape love is a universal standard that keeps our hearts pure and whole. And it says that uh, God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whoever believes in Him would not perish but have everlasting life. Whoever believes in Him, you know, the thing I'm so thankful with with God is. Uh, He's not prejudiced. He loves black people. He loves white people. He loves Hispanic people. He loves Asian people. God loves everybody because we all came from Adam and Eve. There is no prejudice with God. He loves people of all religions. It doesn't mean all religions are right, but did you know that Jesus is appearing to people all over the Arab world? You know why? Because he loves Arab people. God loves every, there is no prejudice, and here's what that means. With agape love, I'm not going to treat you different because you're a man or a woman. I'm not going to put you down because you're a woman. I'm not going to put you down. A lot of us grew up around chauvinism, and some of you ladies grew, around, grew up around man-haters. And that's not agape love. Agape love means I respect you for who you are, and I will not be prejudiced towards you. And what I'm saying to you is God created marriage upon the foundation of agape love. Only if you're saying to me that you love based on emotion, I'm saying to you, I feel sorry for you. Life's gonna be tough. Marriage is gonna be really hard on you. Been there, been there. But if you're saying to me, I choose agape love. I want all the other good emotions in my marriage. But I choose my spouse permanently, once and for all. And the foundation of the love of our marriage is going to be agape. What I'm saying is, your marriage won't be perfect and there'll be some difficult times, but you're gonna have a wonderful marriage for the rest of your life because you've chosen the only form of indestructible love. Hey, this is Brent Evans with Exo Marriage, and I wanna thank you for listening to the Marriage Today podcast. We believe your marriage has a 100% chance of success if you do it God's way. 
If you enjoyed today's teaching and want to keep learning, hey, subscribe to the Marriage Today podcast and take some time to leave us a review. Your reviews help us spread the word and can encourage someone else in need. For more great marriage content, check out exomarriage.com where you can see all of our marriage building resources, articles, and live events.